Hi, I'm Larry Dignan from ZDNet, and we're here with Ernie Garcia, CEO of Carvana. So we're going to talk about technology, innovation, and you know the approach to become you know the big e-commerce driver of car sales. Hi, Ernie. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. So I guess walk me through the a little history here and and kind of the value prop of buying a car on Carvana. Um, I'm, I'm a customer too, so I, I know how fast it can be and speed up the process. Um, but I guess just walk us through a little history about how it started and you know how, how you kind of came onto the e-commerce spin on this. Yeah, well, first of all, glad to hear you're a customer. I think that's great news and, and glad to hear that went okay for you. So um, what I would say is we started this business about six and a half years ago. Um, we started by looking at, at car buying in general and just kind of asking ourselves, you know, why is this generally a consumer experience that, that people don't love? And I think the conclusion we arrived at is that basically it hadn't changed in 75 years. You know, consumers are changing their preferences all the time. The technology available to people is changing all the time. Uh, but automotive retail hadn't really kept up with the times. And so we set out to, to automate much of the process to reduce costs and reduce friction and give customers a simpler experience. And so today, customers go to our website. We have about 20,000 cars there they can choose from, which is obviously a much larger selection than they get at a traditional dealership. Uh, those cars on average are priced about $1,000 back of dealers. Uh, we deliver the car to their door. They can go through the entire purchase um, online. They can get approved for and select financing. They can get a trade-in value, uh, you know, signed contract, scheduled delivery. And then we deliver the car and give them a seven-day return policy. Uh, so it's a, it's a very different approach to automotive retail, but it's one that is uh, expanding very quickly. We're now in about 140 markets uh, nationwide, and, and you know, we're delivering great experiences one at a time and growing very fast. So what's the approach to technology um, and how do you view it from, you know, as a CEO? Like I know, I know from the experience, I know, you know, DocuSign's in there. Uh, I know customer service has some slack. You're playing around with augmented reality. Um, you know, basically just, just, I guess, walk me through the tech stack and, and what it has to do for you. Sure. So I, I would start with this. I think the way we try to think about every problem is just what does the customer need? And, and then we try to build from there. Um, and so I, I don't think we start with technology. We usually start with the customer and then we try to back into the solution we have to build. So just kind of sequentially going through it, you know, every used car is different. So we have to be smart about which cars we're buying and what price we're paying to make sure that we're getting the cars that customers want. And we're able to get them at a great price and pass that savings on to customers. So there's a ton of data that goes into that. You know, we're looking at feeds of hundreds of thousands of cars every single day. We've got a database of millions and millions of cars that we're trying to use to figure out how we should price cars so we can give customers a, a great experience. Um, you know, we've got reconditioning centers. So every car we buy uh, you know, goes through a process where they get about $1,000 of parts and labor put into them to get them up to our certified standards. Um, you know, there's a bunch of process management we build in that. Some of that is physical process. A lot of that is supported by technology, uh, including technology that connects up to, to learn more about cars so we know exactly what we need to fix on different cars. As you go through the transaction itself, we have to merchandise those cars. So we take 360 degree photography of every car that we've got. We, we have, we're at the cutting edge of, of photography technology and 3D modeling and computer vision to give customers a very rich experience that enables them to understand what that car is all about, you know, without physically being in person uh, to see it. Um, you know, we, we build out all the finance technology. So, you know, we're doing credit scoring, pricing, structuring. That way a customer can click one button, get a proof of financing and move very quickly through the process. So there's technology everywhere. And then because a big part uh, of the core problem that we're trying to address is that customers oftentimes have these, you know, more friction filled uh, experiences than they would like we've got a real cultural focus on great customer experiences. And so, you know, we try to hire people that have a passion for delivering great customer experiences that find meaning in what we're doing and, and value the fact that we're trying to save customers money and time and give them a broader selection. And then we try to build tools for them that enable them to come in maybe without a, a car background, uh, but to still give customers the experience they need. So uh, you mentioned Slack. That's a tool that we use where we've got many different open channels with experts covering everything from registration to financing to, uh, you know, the specifics of any given vehicle. So if an advocate's talking to a customer, they can focus on giving that customer a great experience. And if they run into a question that they don't quite have an answer to, they can quickly hit Slack. We have experts that will respond very quickly. We've even built some programs in, into Slack where we automatically hit our databases and pull in data to, to give that advocate the, the tools they need. Uh, and then we've built our own you know, logistics network uh, to deliver cars quickly to customers. So 
in that, there's a bunch of optimization uh, that you have to do, a bunch of technology you have to build to handle all the scheduling. So we've got a very, very broad problem because you know buying a car, especially a used car, is a very complicated transaction relative to most of e-commerce. And so that leads to a lot of technology across the business that we, that we build out, uh, the vast majority of which we do internally. How, how do you choose what to build and what to buy? So that, that's always a difficult question. I think you can almost always um, you know, build anything and you can probably get some flexibility in building it if you choose to build it yourself. Um, so I think what you need to do though is you need to be intelligent and recognize virtually every technology problem you tackle is gonna end up being many times more difficult than you think when you first set out to tackle it. And so you need to say, is this really a place where the incremental benefits that we're gonna get through customizing this you know, to the nth degree, is that really worth the, the unforeseen difficulty of building it ourselves? Or should we go out and you know partner with someone else and, and use their technology? And so, uh, in the case of e-contracting, we use a third-party provider that handles the vaulting and all the security associated with that because that's not really a differentiating technology for us. In the case of connecting our customer advocates to these various experts, we use Slack. It's a great tool that's really powerful that enables us to to get all those answers you know quickly and easily without us having to invest a ton of money to try to build that ourselves. When we go back to how we're going to value cars, how we're going to um, assess and assign credit, how we're going to build out a photo booth to merchandise that car, how we're going to connect to the data about the car itself so the customer has a simple experience, those are all things that are big differentiating products for us. And so we're going to focus on building those ourselves. So if it's something like customizing, you know, the, I guess the response rates for titles and tags by DMVs in every state, that, that has to be more of a custom application, I guess? Yeah, so generally, I mean, the state of the art there for the most part is go and stand in line at the DMV uh, or, or maybe get a, a relationship with someone at the DMV that you can call and, and they'll do some of the work on your behalf. Uh, many DMVs are much more sophisticated than that and have you know, some APIs that you can access. Many don't. Uh, and so a lot of times we have to build custom applications to make that as simple as we possibly can because our goal is basically to take an antiquated experience uh, that doesn't leverage a lot of technology and car buying itself, try to automate as much of that as we possibly can because it reduces costs that we can pass on to customers in the form of savings. It also makes the experience faster and friction free. And so that would be an area where, you know, the state of the art isn't something that we think is up to the standards where, where we want to necessarily leverage that for everything. So we're going to build some custom technology ourselves. Okay. Uh, what's the role of data science and algorithms in this? I, I mean, I think reading your SEC filings and, you know, listening to your conference calls and all that, I, I think what makes Carvana unique is that it's taken a used car market that was typically local and, and kind of nationalized it a good bit. So you can sort of take care, you can sort of see supply and demand imbalances and move stuff around and, and kind of optimize the, the supply chain, so to speak. Um, what's the role of algorithms and data science in that? So it's got a, a very central role. And, and I want to try to answer that question in a way that's a little different than normal. I feel like in many of these interviews, people can't wait to get the word artificial intelligence or machine learning out of their mouths because it's just, it's, it's so in vogue. But, but the truth is foundationally, our problem is a problem that requires a lot of data centricity. Uh, as I said, every car that we buy sight unseen is a, a differentiated asset. Every car is different. We have to collect all the data we possibly can and be intelligent about which cars we buy. We have to look at all the clickstream data on our website of which cars customers are attracted to and be smart about you know, allocating our capital and our inventory to cars that customers want. We've got a, a standard, a very standard data problem in our credit process. We're trying to give customers you know, as, as few a click financing as we possibly can. And so we're gonna do all that credit scoring and pricing and structuring. We've got kind of um, you know, traditional operations research problems uh, in our logistics network where we have to optimize our scheduling and we have to optimize uh, where we put cars on which trucks because we, we own our own logistics network. So just the reality of our business is that there are many, many different uh, you know, data problems inside of it. And so, you know, we do spend a lot of time on that. Our, our CFO is a PhD in economics. And so, you know, going up to the, to the most senior levels in, in the organization, a data centric approach is truly who we are. It's not just, uh, you know, talking points that are in vogue these days. So how, how do you recruit talent for people who sort of have data in the DNA, so to speak? Because the car industry is not necessarily known for that. So are these outside folks or I guess how do you recruit talent and how do you view it? Yeah, so I think you're, you're right in your assessment. What I would say is I think um, oftentimes the most 
talented data centric people are really interested in working on hard problems and they're really interested in making an impact. And so I think the great news is we have hard problems inside of our business that are just inherent to uh, buying cars and selling them to customers and giving them great experiences and building your own logistics network. The other great news is we compete in a market where there's not a lot of data science being deployed. And so the impact that a person can have is very significant uh, in our business because you know, there's a lot of data to work with, but there's also a lot of differentiation in our data centricity relative to, to others in the market. And then I think the other thing that's really important is, as I said, our CFO is a PhD in economics. It really is part of who we are up to the very top echelons of the business. We, we, we talk about data and the way that we're going to structure our models and, and building things in the right way for the long term. We've got all of our data structured in, in ways that are really flexible. And that's not you know, a, a small uh, portion of the business that's 10 layers down the chain. That goes all the way up to the top and is important in everything that we do. And so I think you know, really talented uh, you know, data-centric people, whether it's you know, modelers or data engineers or, or whoever it is, they love coming to a company where we've got all those properties. So when you look at um, that, that the local market and how you know they're not data centric, so to speak, um, how long do you think it'll be till they catch up? I mean, you know, we always hear data is the new oil, and every industry's there or going there. Um, what about the auto industry and you know the selling of used cars? Is I, I guess why is why isn't data there yet? I think businesses tend to focus in the areas where they can make a difference relative to their competitors, and, and I think in automotive retail, um, generally speaking, the the area where there's the most variability from one retailer to another in terms of what hits their bottom line is how good their back office is at uh, you know, convincing a customer to buy additional products. And, and the differences there are very large, I think, to the realistic differences that people in automotive retail could get by being a little bit more intelligent about which cars they're buying. Um, and so I think you know, it just hasn't been a focal point for the industry historically. It also, because the way this industry is structured, you know, the largest player in the market has a 2% market share. The largest 100 players combined have a 7% market share. There's about 50,000 dealers out there. Most of them are kind of mom and pop businesses that don't really have uh, the capacity to invest deeply in, in data. Um, and then also their business itself doesn't necessarily capture all the data as the customer's going through the transaction experience. When a customer walks onto a lot, there's not really data created. When a customer walks over and looks at a car and you know, opens the passenger door and sits inside, there's not data generated. Um, and so they don't necessarily even have the data to work with to, to begin with. And so I do think that we're in a, a pretty advantaged position that said, like everything else in the world, people are going to move as fast as they possibly can to catch up. When they see someone finding success in an area, uh, you know, they're going to do what they can do to catch up. And so I think our job is to keep you know, hiring and retaining incredible people and, and you know, staying focused and motivated by the difficult problems that we've got and just try to keep running faster than everyone around us and we'll be in great shape. As you apply data to this model, um, what, has anything, what has surprised you since you've started the business in terms of just whether it's consumers or logistics or the industry overall, I guess what surprises have there been? I think for the most part, surprises have been positive. And, and so one way to characterize it is I think um, over time in an industry that automotive retail has obviously changed in the last 75 years, but it hasn't changed a lot. It's been fairly static for a pretty long time you start to get a lot of heuristics that get deeply ingrained uh, about how things are supposed to work. And so an example of that is you can't buy a car sight unseen. You need to be in front of the car. You need to be able to put it up on a lift. You got to be able to check it out. Uh, and that's really, really important to being able to buy a car intelligently. And I think even that belief is part of what has cemented the locality of, of all dealerships being kind of local businesses over a very long period of time because they're physically constrained by needing to see the car before they, they purchase it. I think that we found that with, you know, the proliferation of all kinds of data around if the car has been in an accident and where it was registered and to whom and how often it was registered, as well as all the data out there about the, the different parts uh, and options and features and packages that are on a car. And then all the data out there for all the other cars that have those same parts and options and features and being able to figure out what they've traded for. And then all the historical data on how cars have traded at auction. So you have a sense of what any given car is worth. We can build models now that we think are you know, more, more predictive than human beings standing in front of a car buying it. And that basically means we can buy more intelligently and we can save a ton of money because we don't have to have people you know, out in all these different locations. And then we also can build a national business instead of a local business, which has all kinds of positive feedback, including enormous selection. And, and so I think there's been a lot of areas where we've just found that 
we can take automated approaches and tackle problems that historically have, you know, have held up the industry from, from innovation. We just need to get really motivated people that are really smart, that are willing to go tackle something hard. And oftentimes with the quality technology that we're building and the, the quality of analytics that we're able to put together, we can solve these hard problems and, and move forward quickly. And so th there's been a million surprises too, right? I mean, my job is to spin everything positively, so you got to forgive me for that. <laughs> but, but I think in general, the surprises have been pretty positive. Um, generally speaking, as you, you know, as, as you continue to grow, what, what do you think your biggest tech challenges are going to be? I think the most important challenges are maintaining a customer centric culture and then continuing to hire and retain, you know, really high quality people that care about what they're doing and believe in the mission and, and want to make a difference. And if we do those two things, I just think the, the fundamentals of our industry and the position that we're in today, we're in a really good position. And so I, I wouldn't zoom into the level of any given technology. I think all the problems are hard. I think they're all also solvable as long as you, you know, stay focused on delivering great experience to your customer and you know, maintain great people and, and go out and hire and retain them. Okay. Are, are you guys largely cloud-based? <clears throat> We are. Uh, we use many different platforms, but uh, but virtually everything we do is in the cloud. Okay, so you're not investing in data centers and all that stuff, so. We're not, no. All right, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? I don't think so. Um, I think you know, it's still early days for us. We've got enormous ambitions. Things are going great. We're delivering the best experience we can one at a time. I'm very happy, as I said at the beginning, to hear that you were a customer and, and glad to hear that went well. So. Um, you know, to all your viewers out there, I, I hope you, uh, you'll consider Carvana, at least check us out next time you're looking at, at buying a car. We think we're building something that's really different um, and, and pretty special. All right. Thanks for joining us.